In our last discussion, principle two, we discovered that the founders believe that there's a certain level of, of public virtue, of goodness in the people that had to be and had to be maintained in order for a republic to survive. And now we will be discussing what is the best method. As a matter of fact, this is principle number three, the most promising method of securing a virtuous and morally stable people is to elect virtuous leaders. And uh, I first of all want to direct your attention to the very first quote, which is by Sam Adams on page 59. He says this, but neither the wisest constitution nor the wisest laws will secure the liberty and happiness of a people whose manners are universally corrupt. He, therefore, is the truest friend to the liberty of his country. Now, here he's defining the truest friend, the truest patriot, who tries most to promote its virtue and who, so far as his power and influence extend, will not suffer a man to be chosen into any office of power and trust who is not a wise and virtuous man. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Who is the truest friend of liberty, according to Sam Adams? The one who promotes its virtue. There's a lot of things a person can promote in public office. According to Sam Adams, the most patriotic person is the one who promotes virtue. Wouldn't that be great to have that emanate from public officials nowadays? Let's build the public virtue. Let's build the goodness of the people above all else. And he says, the one who seeks to elect only wise and virtuous people. That's your best patriot. And uh, how, do you, how do you determine who is wise and virtuous? In other words, you find those people who have proven fidelity. Don't, uh, don't put all of your confidence in somebody who is... Uh, Unknown. You gotta, you gotta know about the person. Well, turn over to uh, page 60. Here's an interesting quote which Madison uh, gave in the Federalist Papers. See if, you, uh, see if you believe this. He says, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. You believe that? If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. When would controls on government be unnecessary if men were angels? Well, uh, that's not going to happen, at least in our present situation. So, you ask, how do you best develop public virtue? And the answer must be by having leaders of strong private virtue. Somewhere they have to have already proven themselves before they come into public office. And the way they prove themselves to be capable and to be good public servants is to be good private uh, servants, to have done something privately that uh, people can notice and say, aha, we would like you to serve because of what you have done privately. We would like you to serve your country. And uh, we're going to talk now about this word, aristocracy, because Jefferson identified two kinds of aristocracy. Um, on page 61, he said, there is an, you see the quote there on 61, middle of the page, he says, there is a natural aristocracy among men. The grounds of this natural aristocracy are virtue and talents. There is also, he says, an artificial aristocracy founded on wealth and birth without either ta virtue or talents. For, these would it, for with these it would belong to the first class, the natural. So what's he saying here? There's an artificial aristocracy based on what? Based on inheritance, based on wealth, based on social status, 
In other words, you're part of the artificial aristocracy if you're born into an aristocratic family. Or if you have enough money that you can buy your way into it or, or a certain social status. But Jefferson is saying and prefers the natural aristocracy, which is based on what? What did he say? Virtue and talents. Proven ability. Based on your accomplishments. As a public official, no. As a private citizen. Then he says, follow along here, and indeed it would have been inconsistent, well let's see, back up one more sentence, the natural aristocracy I consider as the most precious gift of nature for the instruction, the trusts, and the government of society. See Jefferson's uh, preference for natural aristocracy. And indeed, he says, it would have been inconsistent in creation <clears throat> to have formed man for the social state, speaking of the creator, and not to have provided virtue and wisdom enough to manage the concerns of the society. The creator, he said, wouldn't have done that. <clears throat> so man must be capable of enough, what does he say, virtue and wisdom to develop a good society, because that's what we're placed here for. May we not even say that that form of government is the best, which provides the most effectually for a pure selection of these natural aristi into the offices of government. Do you understand that concept? In other words, what Jefferson seems to be saying is, you let people develop their own talents and their abilities in some private endeavor, whether it's building a business, whether it's developing uh, a company, uh, whether it's learning how to be a great teacher, uh, whatever a person chooses to do, you let them develop their own natural abilities on their own. See what they're like in society. See what they're like in the community. Do they help other people out? Do they do things in their cities and states and counties and, and towns and churches and families to lift and to build and to motivate people to do good? He said, those are your natural aristi. In other words, you let the leaders rise to the top. When I was on the farm, we used to milk cows. And you'd take the milk, the raw milk, and you'd set it in the refrigerator overnight. What would happen by the next morning? The cream would rise to the top. And then what could you do with the cream? You skim it off, and it makes delicious butter. And then you go through a process, and you make other things. Buttermilk, and so forth, and cottage cheese, and... Anyway, lots of different things. I mean, this is, this is the cream. You let the cream rise to the top, and those become the natural aristi, which Jefferson said then, you form your government so that it will have a process by which you can skim the very best leaders who have themselves risen and proven themselves privately, and you take them and you say, will you serve in government? Will you serve your country? Do you see that concept? It's beautiful. It's Jefferson. Natural aristi, natural aristocracy. <coughs> I uh, get a little concerned, as I did a while back, when uh, I have, was visiting with a young man who was just graduating from college. Uh, in uh, political science. And I said, what do you want to go into? And he says, oh, I, I want to go into politics. I want to be elected to public office and serve the public. Well, according to Jefferson, what do you, uh, what do you say to a young man like that? I was very automatically concerned. He hasn't proven himself anywhere. He hasn't proven himself to, uh, to have gone through the fire of life lived under the laws that have already been passed, pay taxes under the laws that have already been passed. See, we want people who have experience. We want people who have, who have paid these high taxes so when they get into the legislature, they know what to do with them. 
Somebody right out of college, what do they know? And have you noticed how many people today in public office have been there so long, maybe have never even held a job outside of government? Jefferson would say, that's not wise. You're going you're gonna to have problems with that. Well, look at uh, page 62. Here's, a, here's an amazing quote from Cicero again. Remember Cicero from the first principle? He said this, middle of 62, For there is really no other occupation in which human virtue approaches more closely the august function of the gods than that of founding new states or preserving those already in existence. What's he saying there about, about uh, uh, the occupation, as he calls it, but the position to formulate a new state or to preserve the rights of the people. He said there's something godly about that that you find in no other occupation. And if the Creator gave us our rights, do you think the Creator is interested in us preserving our rights? See, Madison would say, oh yes, or Cicero rather would say yes. Uh, he would be as much interested in preserving our rights as he did in giving us our rights to begin with. And so Cicero comes along and says, there's something godly, this function of government, of preserving rights. Do you see that? That's, that's interesting, isn't it? Then you have John Adams who comes along and he says, politics are the divine science. Whoa. To call politics a science is really quite something. Most people would today would say and do say politics is an art. What's the difference between an art and a science? A science is built on very definite principles. An art is kind of fluid. It's very subjective. It depends on what a person's uh, feeling is about it. It's negotiating. And John Adams says, no, no, politics is a definite science. It is built on definite principles. Good politics built on definite principles. That's a science. Isn't that interesting? And not only he calls it a science, he calls it a what? A divine science. Now that's, uh, that's interesting. There's something, as he would agree with Cicero, there's something godly in this function of serving in politics. Well, he goes on and he says, how is it possible that any man should ever think of making it, politics, subservient to his own little passions and mean private interests? And I love this next part. Ye base-born sons of fallen Adam, is the end of politics a fortune, a family, a gilded coach, a train of horses, a troop of livery servants, balls at court, splendid dinners and suppers, Yet the divine science of politics is at length in Europe reduced to a mechanical system composed of these materials. Amazing. What is this, what is this uh, uh, politics all about? Is it, uh, is it an art? Is it just uh, whatever you can get, whatever you can convince other people to do? That's politics? John Adams would say no. No, real politics is studying and finding the principles, attaching yourself to natural law concepts that really work, truth, and then governing yourself accordingly and building a government to help everybody do that if they want to. Isn't that amazing? That's, uh, that's John Adams. And then, he, and, then he, uh, and then he says this, kind of lamentably it looks like, what is to become of an independent statesman? Where are the independent statesmen, he's asking? One who will bow the knee to no idol, who will worship nothing as a divinity, but truth, virtue, and his country. I will tell you, he says, he will be regarded more by posterity than those who worship hounds and horses. And although he will not make his own fortune, in other words, you don't get rich in politics, or you shouldn't, he will make the fortune of his country. Isn't that a beautiful concept? That's, uh, that's uh, John Adams. 
And then in his writing to his wife, Abigail, who asked him, John, why are you doing all this? Uh, you're gone so long. Uh, you know, you, you're doing all this. And she was a great woman, but she, she kind of wondered, do you need to do all this at times? Look at what he said down at the bottom of 63. He said, the science of government is my duty to study. More than all other sciences, the arts of legislation and administration and negotiation ought to take place of, indeed to exclude in a manner, all other arts. I must study politics and war so that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, agriculture, in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. What is he saying here? There seems to be a natural progression here. Once you establish and learn the science of good government and establish a good government, do you always have to go back and reestablish it? No. You have to learn about it. But that doesn't take near the time that John Adams had to spend in establishing it. And that seems to be what the founders are saying to every generation. Learn what we did to establish this. Learn the true principles of liberty and make sure you preserve them so that future generations can enjoy more liberty, more advancement, more technology as you progress through. You see what he's saying here? Great concept, isn't it? Well, let's turn our attention now.